Well, it gives me great pleasure this morning to welcome our speaker, Dr. Catherine Barbo. Kathy is an assistant professor of oceanography at Scripps, and she's in the Geological Research Division. And she's a pretty recent addition to the SIO faculty. Uh, she came here in 2001 after doing graduate work at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. <laughs> and then she did her postdoctoral work at UC Santa Barbara. We seem to get an awful lot of scientists from Woods Hole, don't we? What is it? I, I wonder if it's the weather. Um, <laughs> I was talking to Kathy earlier and she tells me that she and her husband um, love to, to bike and, and spend time on the beach and so I'm beginning to suspect it, it is the weather. Kathy is an extremely accomplished for one so early in her career. She has already been a Fulbright Scholar, a University of California President's Postdoctoral Fellow and most recently a recipient of a NASA New Investigator Award. Kathy's interests are in the area of biological and chemical oceanography, and her main focus is on the interactions of phytoplankton and trace metals. And that's why today she's going to speak on the role of iron in the oceans, and that's a topic that interests me a lot, and I can't wait. Kathy, please. Thank you, Nigella, for that introduction. I'd like to also thank the Birch Aquarium for the invitation to speak with you today. And thank you all for showing up at this early hour for a subject which must seem to some of you somewhat obscure, uh, the role of iron in the oceans. So before I leap into talking about that, I'm going to ask you to pause and think for a minute about the role of iron in a more familiar environment, uh, that's the terrestrial environment, and in our daily lives. Uh, we know that iron is a necessary trace element for all life. Um, if you're like me, you take a multivitamin every morning. And I looked at my women's one a day this morning and saw iron right there on the list of included uh, minerals and vitamins. 18 milligrams of iron for the recommended daily allowance. Iron uh, plays an important role in a lot of metabolic processes. Uh, we also know that iron is a very common element in terrestrial systems. Probably all of us have seen evidence of the presence of iron in soils, uh, reddish colored soils, uh, or sandstones around San Diego. Um, but paradoxically, for a substance that's so common, uh, sometimes the amount of iron in our environment falls short of biological demand. Uh, perhaps you've been told that you are somewhat anemic, you have iron poor blood, and so you have to take an, a supplement to increase the amount of iron. Uh, we probably all remember Geritol commercials from some time ago on television. Or maybe uh, your lawn or your house plants are looking a little yellow and you've had to add some fertilizer that contains iron to uh, help things to grow. So it might seem kind of uh, a paradox that iron can be so common, one of the two to three elements that are most common in the earth, and yet it can sometimes fall short of biological demand. And that has to do with the fact that the environment of our earth today contains uh, about 20 percent oxygen in the atmosphere, and under these conditions, iron exists in a form that is relatively uh, not available to biology. It exists as an iron mineral, an iron oxide, uh, that's not readily biologically available. Um, so in the oceans, the discrepancy between biological demand and iron supply is much more extreme than what we observe in the terrestrial environment. And uh, that makes iron uh, an important player in a lot of ecological processes in the ocean. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So, um, the role of iron in the oceans is a subject um, that's of great interest to me, of course, and I think one of the reasons that I find it so interesting is that uh, you can cover such a, a wide variety of, of topics um, that are related 
to, to the role of iron in the ocean. Um, you can study issues that range from the chemical form that iron takes either uh, within biological systems or, or in seawater to uh, how organisms acquire iron and how uh, the presence of iron can influence the composition of planktonic communities. And at that level, you can also get into uh, very large scale ecological and global issues uh, such as the role of iron in the global carbon cycle. And you can also get into more uh, societal type issues such as the potential for iron fertilization or iron addition to the ocean to have some effect on either the productivity of our fisheries or our ability to mitigate the increase of CO2 in our atmosphere. And so I'll talk about all of those different aspects of the role of iron in the ocean today. But I'm going to start by talking about phytoplankton. So what are phytoplankton? Phytoplankton are uh, single-celled algae, single-celled plants that live in the, at the surface of the ocean. And here are just some electron micrographs of some common uh, types of uh, eukaryotic algae, a dinoflagellate, a diatom, and a coccolithophore. Now, phytoplankton are important for a number of reasons in the marine environment. Uh, for one thing, they form the base of the marine food chain. That's probably pretty intuitive to understand. They're small. They get eaten by uh, s somewhat larger grazing organisms. Those organisms are eaten by larger things, and so on and so on. Um, but phytoplankton uh, also uh, play a role that's probably somewhat less intuitive and that's that they're an important sink for atmospheric CO2. So they actually serve to take CO2 out of our atmosphere and uh, sequester it in the ocean. And that's a very important process in the global cycle of carbon. So how is it that such small organisms that are on, uh, you know, much smaller than you can see with your naked eye, single cells, how can they play such an important role in the global carbon cycle? Uh, well, for one thing, even though they're small, they can occur in great abundance in the surface ocean. This is a satellite view of a bloom of coccolithophores uh, in the North Atlantic. And you can see the, the reflection of these blooms from space because of the calcium carbonate uh, shells that these organisms secrete. And so in blooms like this you can generate uh, biomass that's uh, on the order of you know, uh, redwood forests or, or major amounts of terrestrial biomass. And so uh, we're talking about uh, millions of tons of carbon. And when some of this carbon is transported from the surface ocean into the deeper layers of the ocean, that's an important mechanism for sequestering carbon uh, from the atmosphere. The, and, and that's a process that we call the biological pump, which is shown here in more of a schematic fashion. Uh, phytoplankton, uh, through photosynthesis, takes CO2 out of the surface ocean, where it's in equilibrium with atmospheric CO2, and they convert it into um, their own biomass, or also called organic carbon. And uh, these phytoplankton, uh, as we mentioned, are eaten by grazing organisms. And some of this uh, material is uh, transported, it, it sinks out of the surface ocean and into the deep ocean. And so by removing CO2 from the water, CO2 is drawn in from the atmosphere. Uh, and the CO2 that's converted into organic carbon sinks down into the deep ocean, which is uh, a very significant reservoir of carbon on the Earth's surface. And so um, this biological pump mechanism of marine algae is one of the major um, biological processes by which we remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The other process is the growth of terrestrial plants. Uh, and it's about a 50-50 split between the ocean and the terrestrial environment in terms of the importance of this process for removing atmospheric CO2. And so processes that remove atmospheric CO2 are of, of particular importance in earth science today because 
Um, as you're probably aware, there's a, a lot of concern uh, that CO2 levels are rising due to anthropogenic uh, processes such as industrial, um, industrial processes, uh, automobile admissions, and you can see that graphically here. Here we're looking at the concentration of carbon, of CO2, in the atmosphere over the past 150,000 years. So this would be the present day, and this is 150,000 years ago. And you can see that for most of this period, we've had fairly constant uh, levels of CO2, uh, varying between 200 to 300 parts per million. But here, in the modern day, due to uh, uh, burning of petroleum hydrocarbons to support our industrial economy, uh, we're basically engaged in a massive experiment uh, in terms of how much CO2 we're adding to the atmosphere. And you can see that uh, we're on a pace to increase the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere to levels which are far above any that have occurred naturally in, in the most recent 150,000 years of Earth's history. And so there's concern that uh, due to the greenhouse effect, CO2 in the atmosphere may enhance global warming, which would of course cause uh, major climatic changes and, and uh, it's a matter of significant concern. And so uh, since phytoplankton in the surface ocean are a major means of removing CO2 from the atmosphere and can affect the Earth's carbon cycle, uh, both in the modern day and on glacial to interglacial timescales, there's a lot of interest in the Earth science community uh, and among oceanographers in what are the factors that control the distribution and the growth of phytoplankton in surface waters. And so if we look at the, the distribution of phytoplankton biomass um, in the surface ocean, this is a this is a three-year uh, average of phytoplankton biomass as represented by chlorophyll concentration, uh, which is determined by a satellite. And uh, on this scale, we see that um, the cooler colors, the purple and the dark blue, correspond to very low chlorophyll concentrations or low biomass. And the warmer colors are, are regions of higher biomass. And so what you see is that in the open ocean, the center of the ocean gyres, we have fairly low phytoplankton biomass, and the highest levels of biomass are centered around the coasts. So we know that, um, in general, phytoplankton distributions correspond with the distributions of the nutrients that they use for growth. And uh, phytoplankton are really not that different in terms of their needs from the plants in your garden. They need nitrate, they need phosphate. Diatoms, uh, because they have a silicate shell, require silicate. Um, and so these are usually the nutrients that we think of in terms of what controls phytoplankton growth. But if we look at the distribution of some of these nutrients in the world ocean, we actually see that there's some discrepancy between the nutrient concentrations and the distribution of phytoplankton biomass. This is a map of uh, average concentrations of nitrate, an important phytoplankton nutrient, in the surface ocean. And you can see, again, the cooler colors correspond to low concentrations of nitrate, whereas the red and pink colors are very high concentrations of nitrate. So we can see right away that in significant uh, areas of the world's oceans, there are really pretty high concentrations of nitrate. Looking here at the Southern Ocean around Antarctica, or the high North Pacific, the subarctic North Pacific, there's also a region of higher nitrate concentration around the equatorial Pacific. And if we look back at phytoplankton biomass, um, we can see that it, it doesn't really exactly correspond to the distribution of nitrate. There is somewhat higher biomass in these areas, but uh, given especially the ex exceedingly high concentrations of nitrate in the Southern Ocean, we might expect to see very high levels of phytoplankton biomass in that area if it were just a simple matter of uh, correlation with nitrate concentration. So this discrepancy was a uh, 
matter of dispute and debate uh, for a number of years in the oceanographic community. Uh, some suggested uh, phytoplankton concentrations were being controlled by the presence of grazing organisms or perhaps in the southern ocean uh, limitation uh, by light was a possibility. There wasn't enough uh, light for phytoplankton to photosynthesize and use up these nutrients. And this debate went on for a number of years until in the late 1980s and early 1990s, John Martin, a scientist at Moss Landing Marine Labs, um, proposed the idea that uh, the excess of nitrate, phosphate, and silicate in these areas of the world's oceans was related to the scarcity of another nutrient, a micronutrient, and that uh, micronutrient is iron. And so John Martin first uh, tried to prove his theory uh, by doing very careful work on measuring iron concentrations in different areas of the world's oceans and, and um, also by carrying out some bottle incubation studies. And this is a schematic of the kind of studies that he carried out. And so what you're looking at here is chlorophyll concentration in terms of micrograms per liter versus days of incubation. So in this kind of experiment, water is taken out of the surface ocean and put into bottles or containers. And to some bottles, your experimental bottles, uh, John Martin added some a small amount of iron. And other bottles he incubated under identical conditions, but without any additions of iron. And generally, what he observed in these areas was that Although both the iron added bottles and the control bottles uh, grew similarly for uh, some period of days, eventually the iron uh, containing bottles, the phytoplankton in those bottles really took off and you saw a pronounced increase in the phytoplankton biomass uh, here as represented by increase in chlorophyll concentrations in the presence of iron. So how is it that uh, just the addition of iron to this uh, seawater can have such a dramatic effect on the phytoplankton community. Well, there's a couple of factors at work. And one uh, is, as uh, we talked about earlier, the important role that iron plays in biological metabolism. There's a strong biological need for iron in the phytoplankton community. And this is a schematic of a photosynthetic reaction center. Uh, photosynthesis is just one of the processes that iron plays an important role in. Iron is also involved in respiratory processes, uh, in protect, uh, protection from reactive oxygen species, uh, in acquisition of certain other nutrients such as nitrate. Um, but uh, as you can see here, this is a schematic of a photosynthetic reaction center from a bacterium, Rhodopsidomonas viridis. And uh, within all these intricate curls of protein here, what I want you to uh, particularly notice are some subunits, special enzymatic cofactors which contain iron. And so here we have four uh, units called heme groups, and each of these groups contains an iron atom. And there's another iron atom down here in this reaction center uh, that's also uh, part of the uh, photosynthetic process. And so there's five iron atoms in this one photosynthetic reaction center of which there are thousands in, in the average phytoplankton cell. These uh, iron atoms are involved in uh, the electron transport chain that occurs as a result of photosynthesis. Um, so as you can see, iron um, plays an important role in photosynthesis and other biological processes. So that accounts for uh, the basic biological demand for iron. The other particular thing about these ocean regions uh, that John Martin studied was if you look at where these high concentrations of nitrate occur, you can see that in general they're very far uh, from regions of land mass. Um, you don't see anything like this, you know, pretty close to the coast. You're, looking, you're pretty far out in the ocean. And so uh, you're isolated from potential iron sources. Most of the iron that is added to the ocean uh, comes from land masses. One major form uh, by which iron is added to the ocean is via dust. This is a satellite photo 
of a dust storm over the Atlantic Ocean, a huge plume of dust coming off the northwestern African continent, the Saharan Desert. Um, the Atlantic is a, is a pretty dusty ocean. Uh, you notice you don't see uh, any real regions of nitrate accumulation in the Atlantic. Um, the Southern Ocean in particular is very far isolated from land mass. Uh, most of the land mass in the Earth is concentrated in the northern hemisphere. And so iron is uh, very scarce in these high nitrate environments. Uh, and uh, iron, because it's very insoluble in seawater, uh, the sources of iron that come from the land mass do not uh, move very far from their uh, point of origin. Um, in addition to dust deposition, additional sources of iron to the ocean can come from um, upwelling of deeper water. So when deeper water comes up to the surface, it usually brings a higher iron content, especially if that's happening near the coast, as we'll talk about a little later. Um, and also, uh, really close to the coast, you can get significant additions of iron from uh, rivers uh, and estuaries. So, um, as I mentioned, the, the iron in these uh, high nutrient regions is, is very scarce. And so, the iron concentrations in the seawater are extremely low. And so, I was trying to think of a way to explain just how low iron concentrations can get in seawater. I, I know if I tell you it's present at picomolar to nanomolar concentrations, that's probably not going to mean much to you unless you use those kinds of units in your daily lives. Uh, so I came up with this uh, sort of a visual uh, model. Uh, if we say we have one liter of seawater here in this polycarbonate bottle, I've uh, weighed out in this watch glass here uh, an amount equal to the concentration of the major salts in seawater, the sodium chloride. We know that seawater is fairly salty. You can taste it taste the salt whenever you get seawater in your mouth. And so there's about 35 grams of salt in this one liter of seawater. It's about as much you could hold in the palm of your hand. And the amount of iron that you might see in the seawater if it came from one of these uh, areas of excess uh, nitrate is uh, on the order of 5 times 10 to the minus 9 grams. So uh, maybe you can actually see a little speck on this watch glass. I, I actually added that in with PowerPoint because I can't weigh anything out <laughs> that accurately, even on my analytical balance. So the amount of iron in seawater uh, relative to the amount of other constituents is literally vanishingly small. And so I, I thought this was a pretty clear analogy, but um, my students were somewhat dissatisfied with it. So we were trying to dis discuss other ways I could express this. And, we thought of something everyone's familiar with, and, and that's, uh, that's money. And so I said, if I, if I equate the amount of salt in this seawater, say, to the current size of our federal deficit, which I think recently topped $374 billion, about how much iron would we have in terms of cash in this water? And you'd really only have about $60 worth of iron. So you can see that iron is really very, very <coughs> scarce relative to many of the major constituents of seawater. And so uh, with that uh, sense of the scarcity of iron, I hope you can appreciate uh, the challenges that are faced by chemical and biological oceanographers in trying to uh, do contamination-free sampling and incubation studies uh, on your typical oceanographic research vessel. This is the New Horizon, one of our uh, own research vessels at Scripps. Usually people show photos of the Ravel or the Melville. They're bigger, but I seem to always end up on the New Horizon on my cruises, so it's one of my favorite vessels. But like all oceanographic research vessels, the New Horizon is composed primarily of steel. Uh, there's a lot of rust, and so you're, you're on this metal boat trying to take clean samples in, in the surrounding water, which is extremely low in concentrations of trace metals. And you're trying to process the water that you collect on board the ship. And there are various other sources of contamination. Smoke is continually coming out the stacks. And uh, sometimes 
the cook even dumps things into the water. And so this is really uh, the reason that John Martin was able to make such a breakthrough in uh, ocean sciences and that he developed many of the very specialized techniques that trace metal chemists use today at sea to both collect clean water samples and conduct uh, clean contamination free incubation so that we can really get a sense of the the role of iron in natural seawater and I'll talk a little bit more about some of those techniques uh, a little later on. Um, so as a result of um, Martin's early work in doing bottle incubations and, and carefully measuring iron concentrations, uh, the idea that uh, iron could be a very important limiting micronutrient began to be accepted in the oceanographic community, but there was still quite a bit of controversy. People especially criticized some of the bottle incubation studies uh, since they take place in a relatively small container uh, as not being reflective of actual processes in, that occur in the ocean. Uh, certain things might be excluded, such as larger grazing organisms that could uh, normally control the phytoplankton biomass. And so this led uh, eventually to uh, these really large scale iron addition experiments. Instead of adding iron to uh, little bottles and incubating them on deck, uh, whole crews of scientists went out into the ocean and literally added tons of iron to seawater uh, in a patch that, uh, uh, that was in size several square kilometers. And so this was done in order to uh, get the most uh, accurate and natural sense possible of what actually happens to the biological community in some of these uh, areas, uh, such as the Equatorial Pacific, the Southern Ocean, and the Far North Pacific. Uh, when you add iron uh, to these areas of uh, high concentrations of nitrate, phosphate, and silicate. So the first such experiment that took place was Iron X1. That was a group of scientists from Moss Landing Marine Labs where uh, John Martin was located. This actually took place after Martin's death in 1993 um, in, in the Equatorial Pacific. Uh, this experiment uh, iron was added in one dose to several kilometers of seawater and it resulted in a significant increase in phytoplankton biomass. Um, but there were some complications. Uh, the mass of the patch of water that they added to the iron to was uh, actually uh, subducted. It was covered over by another water mass and this uh, increase in the depth caused some, some complicating factors. So uh, the Moss Landing crew <coughs> went out again in 1995 to also to the Equatorial Pacific to conduct Iron X2 and this time uh, they uh, chose their patch very carefully and they also added iron several times. There were three separate additions of iron made to this patch over the course of about 10 or 12 days. Um, and this experiment resulted in a, a really large, intense phytoplankton bloom in this uh, region of the Equatorial Pacific. Uh, subsequent experiments uh, of, these, of this nature, mesoscale iron additions, have taken place in the Southern Ocean. The Soiree in 1999 uh, was an international group led by uh, New Zealanders, which also resulted in a large phytoplankton bloom. This was the first iron addition experiment uh, mesoscale in the Southern Ocean. Eisenex in 2000, uh, a German group also in the Southern Ocean, also resulted in a significant bloom. And now it seems like we have about one of these happening every year. Uh, Seeds was a, a Japanese uh, iron addition experiment that took place in the far North Pacific, also resulted in a bloom. Ceres, Japanese and Canadians, also in the subarctic Pacific. And most recently, uh, Sofex in 2002, the Moss Landing Group returned to the Southern Ocean to do uh, an iron addition experiment looking at uh, influence of uh, making additions north and south of the polar frontal zone in that area. And so all of these experiments in general uh, have uh, really produced spectacular results. This is a, an, an example of that. This is the cover of Nature magazine from October 2000. Nature is a uh, very well-known, prominent journal in the scientific community. 
And this, uh, the cover of Nature, is devoted to the results of one of the Southern Ocean iron experiments, soiree, that took place in 1999. And so uh, what you're looking at here is, a, again, a satellite image uh, of the bloom as seen from space uh, that developed as a result of adding iron to this seawater. So this is a scale here. This little ring here is an area of higher chlorophyll concentration as a result of the addition of iron by these researchers. And so it's all stretched out in this kind of a ring shape, even though it was added more in the form of a patch. The circulation in this area is very intense, and so the, the patch got stretched out into this uh, ring-type shape. And so uh, these mesoscale iron addition experiments not only uh, seem to prove uh, John Martin's hypothesis that iron limitation is responsible for uh, the excess nitrate present in certain areas of the ocean, but it also, uh, no one had ever done these kind of experiments in the oceanographic community before. Um, and so it raised a lot of excitement um, and a lot of speculation among oceanographers and among the, the general public as to whether these kinds of iron fertilization uh, processes could somehow be used to enhance the efficiency of that biological pump that we talked about at, at the beginning of the talk and provide a way to enhance the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere by phytoplankton. Could we add iron to these regions of the ocean uh, that have all the other nutrients necessary for phytoplankton growth, generate uh, these kinds of large blooms over many square kilometers, uh, have this biomass sink out of the surface ocean and, and sequester uh, CO2 in the form of organic carbon, and maybe um, this could help mitigate uh, the potential climatic problems that could happen due to the fact that we're increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, scientists are also interested in the role of iron uh, naturally over glacial, interglacial time scales in influencing Earth's climate. And so, although all these experiments generally produced uh, significant, very significant increases in phytoplankton biomass in surface waters, um, whether they actually uh, enhance the uh, removal of CO2 from the atmosphere by causing an increased removal of organic carbon from the surface ocean is still up uh, to debate. This is some data from a couple of different iron addition experiments. This experiment in the Equatorial Pacific was the second uh, Iron X experiment, Iron X2. This is also the soiree experiment in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica. So what you're looking at here is chlorophyll concentrations as a proxy for biomass. And you can see in both experiments, uh, on the, on the x-axis you have time in days since the time that iron was first added to the seawater patch. You can see there's significant increase in phytoplankton biomass. Now, uh, here on this axis we're looking at uh, particulate organic carbon flux. You can think of that as the removal of organic carbon from the surface ocean. Are we actually getting this biomass to sink out of the surface ocean and go uh, down into the deeper layers of the ocean. In the case of the Iron X2 experiment in the Equatorial Pacific, we do seem to get a significant increase in this transfer of carbon from the surface ocean to the deep ocean. Uh, but in the case of the Southern Ocean experiment, Soiree, we're not getting an increase in uh, organic carbon uh, removal flux. And so, um, and it, we continue to uh, get varying results from these different experiments. So in, in the early 90s, John Martin uh, made this, which is, this is a famous quote in oceanography, give me half a tanker of iron and I'll give you the next ice age, um, which he implied that uh, by adding iron to areas like the Southern Ocean, we could take a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, and uh, really reduce global warming and actually cause an ice age. Um, he, he said this mostly for effect. I don't think he was entirely serious. And the more of these experiments we do, the more that we find that 
we really need to know a lot more uh, before we might think that we could engage in large-scale iron fertilization as a way to solve our problems in terms of increasing atmospheric CO2. I, I'd like to stress that uh, most scientists, myself included, would not advocate um, large-scale iron fertilization of the ocean without <coughs> considerably more research. Uh, we really don't know at this point whether we might achieve our objectives and get an increased flux of CO2 uh, into the ocean, remove it to, and sequester it at depth and uh, retain a, a happy and healthy ecosystem, or if we might end up with a scenario where we really haven't increased our CO2 drawdown from the atmosphere that much, but at the same time we've also caused uh, significant changes to the oceanic ecosystem, uh, either by decreasing the amount of oxygen in uh, deeper waters due to um, causing these algal blooms that sink and uh, respiration consumes oxygen, we get uh, significant species changes. And so um, there's still quite a bit of work to be done uh, before we would know whether iron fertilization uh, could be an effective uh, remediation for increasing CO2 in the atmosphere. So all of this may seem somewhat remote to you, talking about adding iron to the southern ocean around Antarctica. Uh, it's very far away and uh, CO2 in the atmosphere isn't something that we th usually think about on a daily basis, but there's another aspect to iron fertilization that is somewhat closer to home. And that's the idea that we might actually be able to increase the productivity of our fisheries by fertilizing certain areas of the ocean. And that's actually uh, an idea that's been floated for our own California current waters. I recently served as a reviewer for an article that was submitted to a national fishing magazine um, which actually talked about fertilizing the waters of the California current, adding iron somewhere up off Alaska and letting it flow down through the system, increase the plant biomass at the base of the food chain, and lead to um, more uh, large game fish. And so uh, this might at first seem like a crazy idea, and, and actually I think it is, but um, <laughs> be, beyond that, uh, you might be puzzled in that so far I've been talking about areas of the ocean where iron is scarce and a limiting nutrient and those areas are very far from land um, around Antarctica in the middle of the equatorial Pacific. Um, how is it that we can develop a, a situation where iron might increase uh, phytoplankton biomass so close to the coast? Actually recently researchers uh, studying this is the central California coast here around San Francisco have determined that during certain parts of the year, um, during spring upwelling, which is when cold, nutrient-rich water comes from depth up to the surface ocean, uh, providing nutrients for plant growth, um, we get a situation where we have a lot of uh, nitrate and phosphate being added to this system, but very little iron. And so you can actually develop um, communities that are very severely iron-stressed. Uh, right off the California coast uh, during s spring and summer upwelling. And so I'm going to now talk about some work that we've been doing off the California coast somewhat further south in our own Southern California Bight. And this work is done in conjunction with the Cal Coffee program, California Cooperative Oceanic Fisheries Investigations, which is a 40-year time series um, of fisheries observations uh, that's conducted by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and also the National Marine Fisheries. Uh, this time series is one of the oldest uh, in oceanography. It's also been extremely valuable in terms of fisheries management um, and in terms of uh, producing uh, valuable data sets. Uh, and the Southern California Bight is also an important region to study in that uh, it's a region where uh, most of the fish in the California current spawn here in the Southern California Bight. So this is a really important uh, region, both ecologically and scientifically, uh, as a well-studied region. And uh, despite the length of the Cal Coffee time series, there was really no data on the role of iron in this ecosystem. And so when I came to Scripps in 2001, uh, one of my interests was to 
try and uh, generate some data on iron concentrations and look at the role of iron in the biological community in this area. And so these are just some photos of some of our early sampling efforts. This is a pulse sampling that we did off the New Horizon in July 2002. And uh, this might look kind of, kind of bizarre. Um, I can tell you that the, the crew thought it was pretty bizarre. They call this the dipstick and all kinds of things. This is actually one of the oldest but simplest methods of trying to get trace metal clean samples from a boat. And basically it's just a really long, about 20 foot long fiberglass pole with some carefully cleaned bottles uh, mounted on the end of it. These are actually mounted on a plexiglass uh, piece so they're not just suspended in the air. And so while the ship is moving forward very slowly, uh, the idea is to stick this pole out way over the side and, and grab some water. And we also use some of this water to conduct incubation studies. Uh, uh, s similar to the ones that I described that John Martin has done. Um, and so, uh, and, uh, so all our water is, uh, we process it in a special area in the ship that's uh, only filtered air and uh, we use a lot of uh, plastics, plastic gloves, plastic bags to try and keep things uh, trace metal clean, as we say. This is uh, from our most recent cruise about a year later in July 2003. Uh, this is my graduate student, Andrew King, using a special uh, water sampling device called the GoFlow bottle, to, uh, which enables us to collect trace metal clean samples uh, from depth. This bottle is mounted on a, a non-metallic line and lowered. Uh, it stays closed at the surface and opens up at depth. It's Teflon coated inside, uh, all plastic construction, so you can get uh, metal, metal free samples. Uh, Andrew also used uh, a pumping system uh, to get surface water to set up incubations, basically a long Teflon tube that we lower into the uh, ocean of 10 to 15 meters well off the side of the ship and to collect uh, large volumes of water to do incubation studies. And so I'm just going to talk about some of Andrew's results from this cruise. Uh, here we're looking at uh, areas where we're seeing concentrate, measurable concentrations of nitrate in the surface. And so uh, we're going to look at three stations here where we saw uh, nitrate uh, in the surface waters. Uh, you want to do your iron additions in an area where there is nitrate because if there isn't, uh, you're not going to see any effect. And so we're going to look at this station here, 9053. Uh, 8080 and 8070. These numbers are just uh, station location references and a station up here, 7755. So I'm just going to go from the southern station to these, uh, these stations here and then this station up here. And so this would be the southern station. These are those two more northerly stations and this is the far north station. Here we're looking at some of Andrew's incubation results. The iron containing bottles are the dark dots and the controls are clear. We're looking at increase in chlorophyll A over time in days of incubation. And you can see that at every one of these stations, we see a measurable increase in phytoplankton biomass in the bottles where we've added iron. If we look at what components of the community were responding to that iron addition, here we're looking at just three of those stations, the far south, uh, further up, and the very far northern station. We see that we generally have a community that starts out here at, at the initial time point, very low concentrations of diatoms, it's dominated by small flagellates and coccolithophores. And as a result of the iron addition, uh, we see a strong response from the diatoms. They usually increase their abundance by more than a factor of 10. But because they're such a small component of the community to begin with, they still remain a relatively minor component at the end of our experiment. And we still have a community that's dominated by coccolithophores and the small flagellates, which also respond strongly to iron addition in most cases. And these are the same experiments. And here we're just looking at the drawdown of nitrate in these bottles as a result of the iron addition. So again, the iron added bottles are the black dots 
and you can see that in all cases, concentrations of nitrate in the incubation, the nitrate that's naturally present, are reduced as a result of the iron addition and the corresponding growth of the phytoplankton. So uh, we've done a number of these incubations in the bite over about the past year. Uh, this is just sort of a summary of stations where we uh, found nitrate present in surface waters and did an iron addition incubation. Uh, the red dots are where we saw a response to the iron addition and the blue are where we didn't see a response. And in about half, half the time we see a significant response of the phytoplankton community. And so uh, we think there's probably several processes going on. Uh, during spring and summer when you have strong upwelling around the islands or around Point Conception, sometimes you can uh, get uh, enough nitrate and phosphate but the iron is not uh, lifted up off the shelf sufficiently to give you a, enough iron supply to use up the nitrate in that water. Sometimes you can probably get blobs of water that upwell off Point Conception and then age and float in, a, in an eddy out, further out, and you use up your iron faster than your nitrate, and so you can get an iron limited scenario. Uh, also at other times we have upwelling occurring pretty far from shore in the open ocean. And uh, during those occasions, we can get uh, nitrate, but not enough iron. And so we're, we're pretty uh, excited about these results, if only that we're finding some new and relevant information in a time series that's already 40 years old. And so we're going to be continuing our studies of the bite. We may even see additional sources of iron. This is a satellite photo of the ash plumes, the smoke that was produced during the recent California wildfires drifting out over the bite. And we're actually doing some experiments with a high school student uh, for her um, science fair project to look at whether uh, this kind of ash addition can have an effect on the phytoplankton community. And so I'll just close by uh, going over some of the important questions that we're uh, looking at now in terms of the role of iron in seawater. Um, in terms of potential ecological effects of purposeful iron fertilization. Um, and there's a lot of uh, issues to that, smaller things that we need to look at, such as what are the chemical forms of iron that are actually taken up by marine phytoplankton. Uh, iron can occur in many different chemical forms, and some of them are useful to the phytoplankton and some are not. And so that's a very active area of research in my lab and in others. Um, the retention of iron in the upper ocean is an important factor in how long a bloom of phytoplankton can persist following iron addition. Um, so we're looking interested in processes that recycle iron efficiently and keep it in the upper ocean. And finally, as we've seen, uh, we're still refining our view of what areas of the ocean are actually iron limited. Uh, for uh, many years uh, since John Martin's early hypothesis, we are focused on open ocean areas of high nutrient and low chlorophyll concentration like the Southern Ocean. Uh, as I've shown recently, we're finding uh, instances of iron limitation closer to the coast. Um, and so uh, we're looking at different areas of the ocean that might be iron limited, uh, both in terms of horizontal and vertical uh, areas. And so I'll just close with my acknowledgments. Uh, the work that I do would no way be possible without the students in my lab. Um, all my students are great. Andrew here is highlighted because he uh, did the work on this uh, Cal Coffee project in the Southern California Bight, which was supported by uh, the NASA New Investigator Program and uh, other funding that supports our other research. Thank you. So that question related to potential connections between overfishing of certain fish populations or in certain areas and uh, the uh, phytoplankton community, I think. And um, that's, a, that's a really good question and it's a, it's a very complicated topic. The oceanic food chain is very long. 
uh, has many steps and is very complex. I think we're just really right now trying to get at that kind of a connection and data sets like what we have from Cal Coffee are going to be extremely important because there we look at the whole food chain. So I, I can tell you that uh, in basically when we have less diatoms blooming in some of these coastal upwelling regions, you, you will see uh, a general correlation with decreases in, in higher fish productivity. Uh, there's probably a lag time between that, um, but we know that that has to do with cycles like El Nino and La Nina, where we have less upwelling, we get less phytoplankton growth, fisheries can be depressed. But um, it's hard to get any more specific than that at this point. The uh, question had to do with what form iron is added in these experiments. In the mesoscale iron addition experiments, it's added in the form of ferrous sulfate, so that's an, an iron 2 sulfate salt. Uh, in bottle incubation experiments, you would add it in that form or perhaps as an iron chloride salt. So it's not added, uh, it's added as an inorganic salt. Uh, people that are looking into potential iron fertilization strategies are, are looking into uh, whether iron can be added in a form where it's complex by organics, which would perhaps increase the retention time of that iron in the surface ocean so it wouldn't precipitate, but it would still be available to the biological community. question had to do with kelp and, and iron in seawater. Um, no one's really looked at that, although I have had some discussions with scientists at Scripps that study the kelp community uh, as to whether iron could be a significant nutrient for kelp. Um, uh, there's a lot of interest in kelp in terms of uh, its benefiting from uh, nutrients found in sewage, uh, like nitrogen and phosphorus, and certainly there's a lot of iron in, in that sewage as well. And so, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I don't think there's a lot known about how kelp acquire their iron, whether they might take it up through the, the, the roots where they adhere to the sediment or whether it, more likely it would probably come in through the fronds of the kelp. And so um, kelp are usually in coastal environments where I would think that iron would not be that scarce, but um, it, it may be something worth looking into just because maybe the iron is not uh, biologically available. There's a lot of iron, but it depends on the chemical form, so. Uh, so the question had to do with the satellite images I showed of the concentrations of nutrients uh, in surface waters. Um, yeah, those, those images were, were multi-year averages. There is some seasonal change that you see in terms of nutrient concentrations. Um, I don't think we have a long enough satellite time series yet to really look at, I mean it, it would be great to have that kind of uh, a view over glacial interglacial time scales, you know, that would tell us a lot about, but, no, I don't, I don't think so, not, not, not yet. There are some indications that there are some interesting changes happening in the Bering Sea area in terms of, uh, iron and nutrient concentrations. And you can sometimes see uh, the results of El Nino uh, Pacific decadal oscillation uh, in terms of uh, the phytoplankton concentration. So if we did a compendium of the surface nutrients, we might see changes during those time, time periods. 